thank you for attending. Uh, I know it's that second day of conference after party and legal topic, it's kind of deadly combination, but I would try to avoid uh, legal stuff as much as possible, but of course some of that would be required. And today we will going to talk about uh, fan art and fan art has no legal definition. Luckily, not everything has its own legal definition, but fan art includes two components. One of them, of course, is creativity of fans, gamers, players themselves, but there is also a second component of that. That is, fan art is based on games um, and their protected elements from copyright law protection. It could be music, it could be visual, it could be characters from the game. So in case of fan art, we have combination of those two elements. One is creative creativity of fans, and of course, second is games IP. And what we are searching for and what we are looking for is some sort of balance of interest uh, between fans, gamers, and IP owners, holders. And I'll try dive into that and try to draw that line uh, between uh, interests of both parties. But let's start with some good messages. And the good message is that we all love fan art. Gaming business loves, loves fan art. Players, gamers themselves love fan art. And that is for many, many reasons. One of them, of course, is that fan art shows creativity, support, and interest in the game. And therefore, it's part of game success, uh, especially, of course, in terms of uh, financial, business, and commercial um, perspective. And uh, fan art may influence and shape the market from both perspectives. In one scenario, we have game of high quality in terms of characters, gameplay, graphics, controls, or other elements, and that brings some success to the game and results in creating of fan art. But we have also other perspective in which uh, influencers or gamers, players, may create a trend for a particular game. It happened a lot of time before in past and will probably happen many, many, many more times in future. So in case of fan art, fan art can also be recognized as part of marketing and promotion activity from gamers and players. And of course, last but not least, fan art can create platform of communication between gamers and players and developers, studios, publishers, and other entities involved in gaming business. Uh, so we have a huge variety of fun art. We have artwork, for example, graphic posters. It may be um, less complicated from the perspective of copyright law, but it's also very, very creative. Uh, cosplay, of course, is trending and gaining um, very much. We have more complex or more interactive forms or more digital forms, you may say, like websites, streams on YouTube, Twitch. We also have modification or modes uh, that uh, can change the game's characteristics, for example, in terms of graphics, bug fixes, or other elements, including also adding some content to the games. So we have a lot of different approaches here and a lot of different perspectives from copyright law. Because, for example, if we have screenshots from games, if you look at this from formal way point of view, you have screen from a game and that could create some infringement of copyright law. But if that screenshot is involved in bigger form created by fan, for example, even criticizing or talking about or discussing uh, about the game, it may create some sort of fan art, but it, uh, it is, of course, um, that we have a huge variety of that types of fan art. And now we need to put some sort of legal framework on that because that allows us 
a next step to try to divide what should be allowed, what should not be allowed, and what should require some sort of permission in, in terms of creation and using of fun art. And uh, of course, the important thing here is that we cannot forget about copyright law protection because developers, studios, games business put a lot of effort, money, time, resources in creating a unique IP. And it is pretty fair to say that for that, for that reason, it should be protected, of course, uh, even if we are talking about some type of fan art because of course we are receiving fan art as something friendly and something that we appreciate but in some cases uh, i will get to that in uh, next slides it may create some sort of risks for interest or even harm or some sort of infringement and if we are looking at fan art from copyright law perspective we may consider recognize fan art as something that we called in law derivative work. Derivative work is simply a combination of two elements. We have something that we are calling underlying work. And in the case of fan art, of course, underlying work would be uh, creative elements of the game. And then we have input of creativity from fans, gamers, and players. And when we have that combination, we are creating something that we call derivative work. And that derivative work, for example, I don't know, artwork, posters, it becomes separate and independent work from the copyright law perspective. But the, there's go tricky part, uh, so to speak, because since it is combination of two elements creative, created by other entities or other persons, for example, fans and IP of game studio, uh, we are in some sort of uh, uh, permission uh, uh, requirement because if, for example, fan, for, for example, would like to create fan art and then sell it as a standalone product, it would require the consent of the gaming company. But if for any reason, for example, uh, that company would like to use that fan art for promotion or marketing of company, it would also require the consent of gamer or player. So in fact, in case of fan art and derivative rights, we need to have formally, at least from formal point of view, consent of both parties, simply because both parties put some creativity and that is protected by copyright Law. Of course, it is general legal framework for, uh, for fun art that may be recognized in sometimes also as simple infringement or sometimes as type of fair use, for example, right to quotation, but in many cases it should be recognized as derivative work. So, next question, which is very important, is what is fun art policy? Because it's in title of presentation. A fan art policy. And fun, fan art policy is simply sort of rules and basic regulations on which fan gamer player may create fan art and use it for many purposes. And that's the basic legal definition of fan art policy, some sort of regulation bylaws which, um, uh, which uh, provides what is allowed, what is not allowed, what require permission. And uh, uh, important question in that is, do we need fan art policy? And we can take two approaches here. One approach would be, of course, that we don't implement any fan art policy. And in that case, uh, we simply look, look what's going on in fan art community. Some uh, activities of fan art community may be recognized as positive and acceptable and in compliance with law. Some may not. In case if they not, we can't um, take any actions in, in, in terms of, of infringement. And that is one possible approach. Second possible approach is to implement in our developer studio company, gaming business company, uh, fan art policy. And why is that important? And why I think, of course, it is a better solution for many, many reasons. One of them is legal awareness or knowledge of fans and gamers. In many cases, 
possible infringement of rights or copyright law um, uh, uh, results not from intention to harm or infringe, but from perspective of lack of knowledge. Not every gamer, of, for obvious reason, uh, is is lawyer, and in many cases, uh, uh, in many cases, that gamer, it's not his intention to or his or her intention to infringe our rights, but it's lack of knowledge. Simple player does not know if something is acceptable from legal perspective. Other thing, of course, in fan art policy, we can try to explain fans, gamers, and player why this is important, why copyright games to, uh, why uh, games are protected from copyright law. So it creates some sort of form of communication because uh, it is uh, rather likely that someone will comply with regulations if he or she understands um, that regulation. So we, in that part of transparent communication, we might explain that we put a lot of effort and money resources and we appreciate creating and using fun art, but some um, the activities should be considered as in compliance with law and regulations, other done. So it creates some sort of balance of interest. And if you decide to have one fan art policy, you can also take two approaches here. One is that to create general fan art policy, which should, which would be applied to all types of games and products. So uh, irrespective, irrespectively of which game or product you are talking about, you have one fan art policy, for example, which allows for twitching or uh, streaming on YouTube or which allows creating um, artwork and displaying on social media. You can also uh, uh, decide that some games, for example, are uh, more important for many reasons or its mechanic or its content is much more important for us. So we can decide to implement a second or a dedicated uh, form of fan art for that given uh, game um, itself. So we can have two approaches here. One, it's usually what, what we see in website is general fan art policy pub published on website for all games in our portfolio. But we can, it's some sort of second approach is end user license agreement approach that we are creating fan art policy, which is designated for given game and um, provides special requirements or special provisions. One thing that is very important to, crea to create a fan art policy in simple, understandable and accessible language, because it's the basis. As I said, it is rather likely that someone will comply with regulations of fan art policy if it's written in simple, understandable and accessible language. So from that point of view, it's very, very important. So if we decide to have fan art policy, which for, from my perspective is recommended approach, we might think what that fund our policy should include. And one of uh, important parts uh, of uh, fund art policy would be introduction. That's the key part. When you can explain gamers, why do you decide that some sort of activities are allowed, other don't. You can also explain why some sort of activities may infringe or harm our business, but other one would be without that uh, negative effect. So that's the most important part of communication because after reviewing introductionary part, the gamer should uh, say in, in his, her mind, oh, now I understand why we block certain actions and allow for other action as regards use and creation of Fun art. I think it's pretty fair to say that a uh, um, rule of no commercial payable use should be implemented in fun art policy because it's something different to create fun art, sharing that fun art with others, gamers, players, and community. And other thing is to try to 
use it for commercial purpose. For example, some sort of paywalls. If you want to have access to fan art or gameplay video, you should pay for that. Uh, so it's hide behind some sort of paywall. Other type of not allowed use of fan art, of course, would be stand alone use. So someone is creating posters, graphics, or statues and selling them for commercial purposes. That also should not be, I think it's pretty fair to say, because uh, at the end of the day, it depends on given IP owner or old, uh, holder or owner to accept certain activities or not. But I think that no commercial payable use is pretty fair rule in fan art policy. Other thing that should be implemented in fan, fan art policy is some sort of general requirement of lawful use. Lawful use uh, means simply that creation and use of fan art is in compliance with our, our fan art policy, but also with rights of any third parties. For example, we can imagine fan art that uses a uh, personal image of other uh, of other person. In that case, our rights as developer studio are not infringed, and, but uh, simply rights of other third party uh, to which this uh, this personal image is referred to may be in, in violation. Other thing that is also important is to that requirement that it's um, fan art is unofficial, so unofficial character. It uh, never we should we shouldn't generally allow the to fans gamers players stating that this fan art is created or approved by IP owner or IP holder. So that's the uh, next important rule. And of course, proper marking of IP holder. I think it's always, uh, and it's also pretty fair to say that uh, owner of IP should be marked in case of fan art. Uh, I think also that uh, fan art should not be allowed to use in other games or products because it's very similar and it's very close to commercial use. As I said, also no standalone use. So uh, any situation in which fan would create some sort of graphic poster, fan art or statue or anything else just for sale and making profit, which should not be acceptable. But we also have um, something that we call monetization. And it's also to decide because in case of monetization, you are not gaining profits directly from the game itself or fan art itself, but rather it is based on some sort of ads, views donations and i think and it's it, you should consider that but i think um, types of monetization may be allowed in fan art policy and it's in compliance with uh, also ip owner ip holder um, uh, business perspective uh, of course uh, provisions uh, regarding license termination because in case of fan art we very often using we are using words like consent, approval, but from the legal perspective, it's simply some sort of license granting by company, studio, to fans to create and use fan art. So in case if there are any violations of fan art policy, there should be also a possibility to term a fan art policy from license point of view. Very important, of course, is contact information, because in many cases there would be situations in which fan or gamer is not sure if that, in terms of fan art policy, given, uh, given activity is allowed or not. So he or she uh, may ans ask the question and try to, uh, to avoid those doubts uh, and to contact directly with IP owner and IP holder. Other thing, of course, which is very formal is changes to fan art policy, which can be made, for example, by republishing its revised version on website. So in some sort of recap, I think that, uh, of course, uh, uh, Fun art should be considered as part of the game's success, and it's 
uh, pick up in promotion and marketing, and also that creates some sort of platform for communication. But as I said, it requires prior arrangements uh, as regards intellectual property and copyright law. And I think that fan art is a pretty good answer to those doubts. And I, of, co of course, recommend to implement one um, as regards your games. So that would be all from me. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, I would happy answer to them. So, in case of the fan art, of course, you need to search for legal basis for that sort of activity and using of games IP. And as I said, uh, derivative rights or work is one of possible legal basis. Other would be, of course, for example, right to quotation, some sort of fair use of, uh, um, of uh, elements under copyright law. So we can, of course, um, imagine situation in which we are uh, searching for legal basis outside finance policy in in some cases that would be legal but at the end of the day i think in most cases when we are creating fan art and putting them on social media like facebook instagram and of course in some cases also some sort of monetization is is involved it is usually acceptable i think that line is not that you are gaining any profits like indirectly from monetizations ads or donations or whatever but that line uh, is drawn um, if you are trying to sell fun art as separate product and in case of instagram if it, it's not covered by fun art policy but because there is no for example fun art policy in that case uh, in that case uh, i think that that should be recognized as allowed because in fact it's in interest of company itself from also IP perspective because it's some sort of promotion and marketing involved. It depends of the final uh, final result of that product because you may have situation where your creativity or your input is bigger. Uh, for example, it's more complicated. You're adding some comments, you're adding some tips, advices. So in fact, you are creating some sort of uh, external work in which you are quotating, for example, part of the game screens or anything you want or anything is needed to create some sort of that uh, document or work. Because in, in some cases, when you are imagined just putting uh, screenshots from the game and some you know go there for example it may be recognized as violation of copyright law but i think uh, at the end of the day um, um, second time it depends if it's against payment or not because if you are preparing some sort of some sort of tutorial and you are distributing it to third parties or the players gamers for example uh, it's different situations uh, from uh, in which you are selling that as a standalone product and that, that that could infringe copyright law so in that's the problem in copyright law that you can it's very hard to put one evaluation on one assessment on any like you have 
tutorial or for example streaming twitching because it may differ but i think if uh, if there is a uh, against payment activity or for payment that should be recognized as infringement of copyright law but because uh, this is also important because from formal point of view, some types of fan art activity may infringe copyright law, but uh, the company or IP holder uh, does not have any interest in pursing claims because it's for marketing promotion. So we have something in law which is co called tol tolerable infringement. So formally there is infringement, but in, at the end of the day, it's in, in, in the interest of copyright owner or holder. And that would be one of the possible situations that we may look at tutorial or other products related to the game that from formal point of view should be recognized as, for example, infringement of copyright law. But at the end of the day, they are in interest of that company or that game. But once again, if there is any payment involved, probably that recognition of tolerable infringement would be different because you're obtaining profits directly by selling that type of document or work. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? So I will have one question for you because I want to understand the perfectly the policy of fan art. Uh, do I understand correctly that uh, the basis of policy, uh, fan art policy, is that the uh, developing, uh, developing studios uh, don't want to lose money because of uh, other, other people? This is the only basis for the fan art policy. Uh, the studios aren't afraid of uh, some, uh, some uh, bad-looking products. They're not afraid of uh, uh, something that they will not like. But they are afraid only of losing money because of uh, some other... Yeah, uh, of course, uh, business perspective is one of possible business perspective, is one of possible um, perspective. But it's very hard to implement a fan art policy that would say that uh, we only accept good fan art. If you are bad at drawing or if you are bad at some activities, we do not accept that. It's very hard. or. It's simply impossible to divide that by that criteria that some fan art is accepted simply because it's good and it's of high value of and quality from art perspective. It's very it's simply it's very hard to provide that in a fan art policy. So of course, business perspective is not the only perspective, but at the end of the day, we need to, uh, well, because we have different situations. For example, uh, given games um, um, have its values and its idea, and we can put in fan art policy that, for example, if fan art is inconsistent with that values, it should be recognized as uh, illegal or infringement. For example, if we ha have a game uh, that is supporting peace on the world, for example, 11-bit studios um, uh, product, this, um, this war of mine, and someone is using in a way that suggests that we um, see war as something that is necessary for the for for whole world to step forward and progress and so on so in that case we would may add some sort of provision that allows us to recognize that art as infringement because it's not compliant with um, uh, with our ideas of a idea of the game itself or its value but providing simple, simply uh, uh, provision that divides art as bad or bad quality and high quality is pretty much impossible. You can add something in fan art policy that you are allowed to terminate those license without any reasoning. For example, just saying, okay, we don't, we, we don't need to explain you why this license and this fan art policy is no longer applicable to you, but just to transfer those uh, assumptions that there is a uh, low quality and high qu 
quality font art and that divides somehow uh, um, the perception of that would be very, very difficult from legal point of view. Okay, so if I make a very bad looking statuette of a uh, wheelchair, that will be ugly, horrible, but it will be still inspired by wheelchair and, and I will be selling this statuette. Will I be accused of infringing the uh, fan art uh, policy? Okay, that, that is one of possible solutions or scenario because please remember that fan art policy is voluntary. So you can make uh, take approach here that or usage of I, games IP would require consent. That's all. So you need to provide to us, for example, sample of that art or given fan art artwork, and we consider whether we accept that or not. If you have any, if you don't have any legal business, that's one of the one of the approaches. Second approach, of course, is um, is uh, to uh, implement voluntary fan art policy, in which, as you as IP owner or holder you're allowed to establish terms, rules, practically uh, what we want in that fan art policy. So you are determining the terms of use and you may try to implement some softer provisions, which more general or uh, encouraging people to simply do uh, high quality fan art, but it's not that possible, it's not, that's not easy from legal perspective in that case. Okay, thank you. Any more questions to Piotr? Oh, yeah, there is one. Do companies really care about it? Because I've seen so much fun art on the internet and I'm sure a lot of it is being solved, but I don't think anything is uh, done about it. Yeah, of course, uh, we can also say if someone wants to infringe your copyright or create fan art, he or she will do it anyway. But of course, if we look at the market and gaming companies, the, the most big, big, big companies have their own fan art policies, not by coincidence, but it's part of transparent communication and part of building relation with gamers and players in as I said, other thing is sometimes lack of knowledge because gamers players don't know what uh, what is allowed and what is not allowed. So of course, yes, in some cases you think that you should not pursue any claims or take any legal action against fans which are some sort of in, so are in some sort of violation. But of course, fan, fan art policy uh, itself cannot protect because you can have copyright infringement if you have or don't if you have or not that um, that that uh, fan art policy it's one of possible approaches and that may help to build that communication and try to explain fans and gamers some um, uh, will acknowledge that terms and conditions, some don't, and we don't have um, much to say uh, in that situation. Thank you. Any more questions or either we all? It seems like we all asked what you wanted for, so thank you, Peter. For thank your you. Thank you very question. much.